Good morning, and I'd like to call this uh, hearing of the uh, Committee on Oversight and Government Reform Subcommittee on Government Operations uh, hearing again meeting uh, to order this morning. Welcome, everyone. Uh, the title of this morning's uh, hearing is Reviewing Alternatives to Amtrak's uh, Annual Losses in Food and Beverage Services. And uh, we have, uh, let's see, four five witnesses, and I'll introduce them shortly. The order of business will be as follows. We'll have opening statements by members, and then we'll turn to our witnesses and uh, introduce them, uh, swear them in, and uh, each of them will uh, provide us with their testimony today. Uh, Mr. Isa, our committee chairman, always said, says, and I'll paraphrase it, that the, our responsibility the Government uh, Oversight and Reform Committee is uh, to be good stewards of uh, taxpayer dollars and to make certain that uh, the people that were represented, uh, that the, their hard-earned uh, tax dollars are sent to Washington, and particularly in a time of uh, difficult financial uh, oh, deficits that are soaring in the United States, uh, that we are uh, again uh, looking uh, to how we can more efficiently, economically, uh, and responsibly deal with the government programs that spend their money. So with that, uh, uh, I'm going to recognize, recognize myself. We'll turn to other members as they uh, join us. and. Then we'll get to our witnesses. Uh, so, again, um, I welcome everyone and uh, thank our witnesses for being here. Uh, today, we're going to um, review uh, the results of an Amtrak IG report. This isn't one that uh, uh, our subcommittee requested, but the Inspector General from time to time. Uh, and this is the Amtrak Inspector General, uh, do review operations. There have been uh, several previous hearings, I know, on the Transportation Committee and Appropriations and other uh, folks have looked at uh, some of the losses that uh, Amtrak has incurred. And one of the biggest uh, areas in which they've incurred losses in, is in food and beverage services. And uh, in addition to this report, Amtrak uh, sent out a press release in October stating they had a, pl a plan to deal with some of these losses, so we'll hear a little bit about that. But uh, as, you, as you may know, Amtrak's uh, losses uh, continue uh, to mount, not only for food and beverage services, but uh, the, the federal government has had to underwrite the total operations of Amtrak uh, last year for an excess of $1.3 billion. Uh, now, during the last 12 years, Amtrak has lost nearly a billion dollars uh, in, uh, in food service. I think they've got that uh, little slide up there. So we're at $999 million in losses in a dozen years. Uh, and unfortunately, those uh, losses continue uh, to mount. Last year, Amtrak uh, reportedly lost $72 million on food and beverage uh, services. Um, Amtrak claims that uh, some significant improvements have, and they've testified in, before Congress, uh, have been made over prior years. And um, if you look at Amtrak's financial statements, it would appear that Amtrak has uh, reduced their losses as they claim by $33.2 million since uh, 2006. But in reality, and again, if you look at this report and also dig into um, their books, uh, sometimes it's difficult to do that, uh, but you can see, in fact, the uh, reduction in losses that they've claimed uh, to Congress and the American public is, in fact, uh, the result of uh, an accounting uh, gimmick. Amtrak, unfortunately, has cooked the books on food service uh, costs. And uh, since 2002, Amtrak has increased the amount transferred to the food and beverage service 
uh, program from ticket revenue by uh, $22.1 million. So in fact, Am Amtrak hasn't actually saved any of that money. They just sift shifted money between uh, accounts to make it look like their losses uh, uh, are being significantly uh, reduced. Another uh, $1.2 uh, million of the so-called savings is an increase in state uh, subsidies. Uh, that does uh, reduce some of Amtrak's expenses. And uh, as you know, we also mandated in, uh, mandated in the PREA legislation that uh, states step, step up to the uh, plate uh, and uh, be responsible for some of the cost of those routes. And those routes, I may say, have been uh, some of the most uh, successful. Uh, we'll look uh, today at uh, uh, not only food service at Amtrak, but we'll look at it some successful examples. Uh, one of those is uh, with the Smithsonian Institution that actually turns a profit. Another, uh, another uh, area we'll look at, and uh, just speaking of the state-supported uh, routes, uh, North Carolina Food uh, Service, in which they've managed to dramatically uh, reduce the amount of uh, losses uh, um, in food service. And, uh, again, uh, do so in a responsible fashion. Uh, in fact, in six years, the reduction in losses that could possibly be attributable to the cost uh, savings or revenue uh, enhancing initiatives by Amtrak is less than $10 million. And I'm sure they'll come before us today and tell you, tell you, uh, you uh, that uh, uh, they are in a downward uh, spiral, spiral on these losses. Uh, we do have reports that this year, uh, again, uh, we'll see a spike in, in those losses, even using accounting gimmicks. And on October 31st, uh, uh, 2013, the Inspector General released uh, the audit that identified an additional $10.5 million that may be saved from incremental adjustments. We'll uh, hopefully hear about those today. So in the report, again, I reference, um, there are some uh, positive suggestions as to how we can bring some of these uh, losses down. Beyond those incre incremental adjustments, the report concludes that additional savings will require significant changes to the current uh, business model. I believe that makes sense, and uh, there's, there's got to be some dramatic uh, changes to make some dramatic savings. When you start to look at where the losses occur, it's clear that significant changes need to be made in some very specific areas. Last year, uh, $71.5 million of the $72 million in losses was directly attributable to uh, losses in long-distance service. Overall, Amtrak spent $1.5, well, $1.50, dollar and a half to earn a dollar in revenue. Uh, and on its uh, food service. On its 15 long distance routes, Amtrak spent more than $2 to earn just a dollar in uh, revenue uh, in the same area. When you look at each of the long distance routes, um, some of the losses become even more startling. All but two routes spend more on labor than they earn in uh, revenue. Six routes spend more on commissary costs than they earn in revenue. One of the most glaring examples of losses is the Sunset Limited, which runs from New Orleans to Los Angeles. I think we focused in the Transportation Committee on the, the cost of um, a ticket is subsidized. Now, we're not talking about food service. First of all, every ticket on Amtrak is subsidized about $40 a ticket. Every one of the 30 million uh, uh, tickets sold last year. But on the Sunset Limited, uh, what do we have the figure there, staff, of uh, Sunset Limited? It's close to $400. $400 a ticket passenger subsidy for every ticket sold on the Sunset Limited. On the Sunset Limited, it also holds a record because it recovers less than 30 percent of its expenses to pro provide food and beverage services. The Sunset Limited spends $3.50 for every dollar earned, again, in food service revenue. 
you got this uh, Sunset Limited chart up there. You can see <laughs> a $9.75 hamburger is subsidized uh, $24.19, an astounding amount. Uh, and I believe every hamburger on, that's sold on Amtrak on average is subsidized around uh, $7. So, uh, all of these uh, taxpayer subsidies for food service uh, do add up. In terms of ridership, uh, Sunset Limited also has the highest losses uh, 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 on providing food service. Every passenger on, that rides on, uh, again, the Sunset Limited route, the food service underwriting cost of the taxpayers $55 per rider. This is astronomical. Uh, while every little bit helps, losses like this won't be recovered by just reducing spoilage. Um, we're going to have to take some major changes. I don't believe a five-year plan is acceptable in which to, uh, to zero out these uh, losses. Uh, and that's pretty simple. When you have a $17 trillion uh, national deficit, uh, when we're trying now to, they're trying to now to uh, up that debt limit to uh, almost another $18 trillion. And then if you look at the money we're spending and losing on these Amtrak services, every dollar that we're spending here at the federal level, we're borrowing $0.43. Cents. So um, again, uh, this is, I think, an important issue, one that deserves the committee's oversight and uh, some immediate attention. Uh, with those uh, opening comments, uh, I'll yield to Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank each of you for coming today. Uh, specifically, Mr. Worley, it's it's good to have you from my home state of North Carolina. And uh, this is indeed an important hearing as our nation is looking at $17 trillion in debt hundreds of billions of dollars annually in terms of a, a deficit. We need to make sure that we're good stewards of the federal tax dollars and, and really uh, represent the American people in a real way to, to minimize losses. Uh, obviously, the food and beverage uh, service provided by Amtrak uh, on our nation's railway right now is, is proving not to be a profitable mar uh, you know, market and ability to provide those services. Uh, I, I res a gentleman I respected very much early on when I got into the business uh, of providing food service. I, uh, I owned restaurants, and he says, well, let me give you rule number one. If you're buying watermelons for $1.10 a piece uh, and you're selling them for a dollar, don't try to make it up in volume. And uh, and that's where we really need to be is is look at how do we how do we redirect this model to make sure that we can look at reforms, uh, eliminate uh, the waste, and and provide better management uh, within the program to minimize losses. You know, while at the same time still giving Amtrak uh, the ability to provide services that the the riders have grown to expect. Uh, looking at specific examples in the private sector and changes maybe in the public sectors that other passenger railways uh, like Piedmont have made uh, in my home state of North Carolina is a good start uh, to getting this, this program back on track. And I look forward to listening to your testimony. I, I want to apologize first to the committee who uh, staff who does an excellent job of preparing and to the chairman. I have another hearing to go to, but we will uh, be providing some questions that we would love to, to work with you on on a regular basis uh, to look at some of the reforms and um, going in a very bipartisan way to try to make sure that we mitigate some of the losses and damages that are out there. But I thank you and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Well, I thank the gentleman, and obviously folks can see today that we have uh, uh, some challenges with uh, members and hearings. Uh, I have three hearings I'm supposed to be at right now in addition to this one, but uh, this one will go on and we will complete it, and when uh, we get other representatives, they'll have an opportunity. We'll give them an opportunity for a statement uh, and also for full participation uh, in the questioning. So at this time, we're going to move forward, uh, and uh, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. We have uh, Mr. Thomas uh, J. Hall, uh, Chief of Consumer Services of the National Passenger Railroad Corporation, Amtrak. We have Mr. Ted Els, 
uh, Inspector General also of Amtrak. We have Mr. Dwayne Bateman, Vice uh, General Chairman of uh, Unite Here Local uh, 43. We have Mr. Ed Howell, Senior Vice President of Retail Smithsonian Enterprises of the Smithsonian Institution. Mr. Paul Worley, who is the Rail Division Director of uh, North Carolina Department of Transportation. We thank uh, all of our witnesses for being uh, with us. This is an uh, oversight and investigations uh, subcommittee of Congress part, and uh, we do swear in all of our witnesses. So if you'll stand, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I'll let the uh, record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Again, welcome each of the witnesses and want to thank you for your participation, especially, uh, especially uh, a North Carolina representative who came from out of town, I believe, and the others uh, here in Washington. With that, we'll uh, start with um, the chief of um, of uh, customer services for Amtrak, Mr. Thomas Hall. Uh, I might say that we try to keep you to five minutes if you have additional information um, or something you'd like made part of the record of, of this uh, hearing. Uh, please just ask uh, me through the, uh, again, the chair or members, uh, and we'll include that uh, in the record. So, Mr. Hall, you're recognized. Chairman Micah and members of the committee, good morning. My name is Tom Hall and I'm Amtrak's Chief of Customer Service. I've worked for Amtrak for 33 years, running our food and beverage operations since 2005. I was appointed the Chief of Customer Service earlier this year. It's an honor to be here this morning on behalf of Amtrak. I will start by summarizing the history of our food and beverage services since our 2005 testimony before the House T&I Committee. At the time, our performance needed improvement and the annual cost of providing food and beverage services exceeded revenues by a factor of two. In 2006, this amount amounted to a total loss of $88 million. This was problematic, and Amtrak launched a program to further reduce our losses on dining car services. We took measures to reduce dining car staff and introduced new products, which were less labor intensive, and we also introduced an onboard credit card collection system. We began development work on a point of sale system and an integrated warehouse inventory management system. We negotiated a better contract with our commissary provider and then obtained even better terms when we rebid the commissary management contract. In 2011, Amtrak OIG recommended Amtrak pursue a program to implement cashless onboard transactions to minimize transaction costs, better utilize employee time, and reduce the possibility of fraud. We have successfully piloted a point-of-sale system on a CELA and certain state-supported services. These systems are slated for system-wide introduction in 2014. This technology will allow us to pilot cashless sales next year. Last year, when we appeared before the House T&I Committee to testify about food and beverage, we had made considerable progress. In inflation-adjusted dollars, Amtrak reduced its food and beverage loss by over 30 percent between 2006 and 2012, from $105 million in inflation-adjusted dollars to $72 million. The total cost to Amtrak to offer food and beverage services to our passengers is about $204.9 million, or just over 8 percent of our total cost structure. Of that, we recovered almost 65 percent of our cost through revenues in FY12, meaning that the loss attributable to food and beverage service is equal to about 1.8 percent of all of Amtrak's costs. These improvements didn't happen by accident. Some of it is the product of ridership growth. Some of it is a product of better support contracts, better technologies, and more efficient processes. We have also introduced more consumer-relevant products, optimized the supply chain, and improved decision support and taken appropriate pricing actions. All of this is designed to improve customer service, promote accountability, and increase the focus on Amtrak's bottom line. We are now developing the plans for the next step, which is the elimination of the food and beverage loss over the next five years. Amtrak's strategic plan focuses on the bottom line. Our food and beverage plan is consistent with this strategy. To ensure proper management focus, we have consolidated responsibility for operations and accountability for financial performance into a single department, which will work closely with each of our business lines. 
The current loss is heavily concentrated in the dining car services of our long distance trains, and we have identified several strategies that will help us to improve the financial performance of the food and beverage service. They fall into six broadly defined categories of work onboard logistics, product development and supply chain, labor optimization, training, rewards and accountability, ticket revenue allocation, technology enhancements, and process improvements. In each category, specifically identified strategies will help cut costs and raise revenue. For example, labor optimization includes aligning dining car staffing with ridership, customer demand, and financial performance to hold down costs. We will also improve sales and the revenue generation by establishing metrics to assess and incentivize employee sales while exploring new pricing and revenue management options. Many of our approaches will expand on ongoing work. Implementation of onboard technologies is underway and is expected to improve revenue recovery and improve decision support while greatly reducing costs. I want to conclude by saying simply that the viable food and beverage service program is vital to Amtrak's health. We believe we have a mission to minimize the impact on the taxpayer while providing an efficient and effective intercity passenger rail service on the national system. A unified food service operation with economies of scale is a component of that system. Food service is necessary, and studies have shown that the elimination of food service on Amtrak trains would cost more in terms of ticket revenue than is spent on the existing service. We nevertheless recognize the importance of getting the food and beverage loss to zero and are committed to making this necessary efficiency improvement within the next five years. Thank you. Thank you. And we will hold questions until we have heard from uh, everyone. Uh, we will now hear from the Inspector General uh, of uh, Amtrak. Uh, welcome and you are recognized. Good morning, Chairman Micah, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss Amtrak's food and beverage service. My testimony today will focus on Amtrak's progress reducing losses and opportunities to further reduce losses by improving business practices, processes, and management information. Losses on Amtrak's food and beverage service have been a longstanding issue, and almost all of the losses were on long distance routes. Over the last several years, Amtrak has taken a number of steps to reduce food and beverage losses by increasing revenue and reducing costs. These steps have trimmed losses by $33 million since fiscal year 2006. Nonetheless, losses were $72 million in fiscal year 2012. Our October 2013 report identified additional opportunities to improve business processes which we conservatively estimate could reduce losses by at least $10.5 million a year. For example, in two fiscal year 2012, aligning onboard staffing with seasonal changes in ridership on long distance routes would have reduced costs by about $7 million. Increasing the sales performance of lead service attendance by just 1 percent would have generated $1.6 million in additional revenue. Shortening reporting times for onboard service personnel on three long distance routes would have reduced labor costs by about $100,000. And charging passengers for complimentary items would have saved $700,000. We also noted that the lack of complete and accurate cost and revenue data hinders managers' ability to improve performance. We also reported that contracting out food and beverage services could offer significant benefits, but also comes with complex workforce and financial implications. Other railroads have reduced costs by contracting out food and beverage services. Although their operations are not directly comparable to Amtrak's, they are generally similar and can provide useful information about an alternative business model. The Downeaster, Alaska Railroad, and the Rocky Mountaineer all contract with third parties to provide food and beverage services. Labor rates under these contracts are significantly lower than Amtrak's. For example, in fiscal year 2012, hourly labor rates for contracted cooks on a Rocky Mountaineer averaged about $15, including limited benefits. 
while Amtrak's onboard employees averaged about $41, including full benefits. It is important to note that this fundamental change to Amtrak's business process would be complex and would involve significant risks. Consequently, this option should be approached in a structured, methodical manner that considers a number of factors, including, first, the benefits that could be achieved by implementing process improvement such as those we have identified before contracting out. This is a best practice step that is often applied in order to ensure that the benefits of efficiency improvements go to the entity rather than the contractor. Second, the applicability of various railroad labor statutes. Third, the safety and security responsibilities of onboard food and beverage personnel. Fourth, the likelihood and consequences of labor unrest. In closing, we are encouraged that Amtrak agreed with the spirit of our recommendations and has committed to prepare a plan that will lead to eliminating food and beverage losses over five years. I believe this aggressive goal demonstrates that Amtrak is taking this issue seriously. In order to achieve its ambitious goal, Amtrak will need a well-developed plan that includes clear organizational accountability, year-by-year -year actions and loss reduction goals, metrics to measure progress, and a sustained management commitment. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my remarks, and I would be glad to any answer any questions the Committee has. Thank you. And we will withhold questions. Uh, welcome, Mr. Conley. And, uh, Could I ask just one question, Mr. Chairman? Uh, we are, uh, Where is Mr. Alves from? Oh, <laughs> I'm from Boston. Go Red Sox! All right, I thought. <laughs> yes, yes. I heard him say good year, relax, Yes, you know, yeah. and a good comeback. And uh, if um, if it's okay, we'll hear the rest of the witnesses, and then uh, yield to you uh, five minutes or whatever time you need for an opening statement Thank before you. we get to questions. So we'll give you a minute to get to settle here. I, mean, I want to hear from uh, Mr. Ed Howell, now Senior Vice President of Retail uh, at Smithsonian. Uh, enterprises. I want to hear from him first, and then we'll uh, finish up because uh, I want to hear from a couple of success stories, and then we'll hear from our third witnesses. Go ahead, uh, Chairman Micah, uh, <laughs> Ranking Member Conley, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify at this hearing. The Smithsonian Enterprises is a division of the Smithsonian Institution, uh, the world's largest museum and research organization. Established in 1846 with a request from English scientist James Smithson, the Smithsonian currently encompasses 19 museums and galleries, the National Zoo, and nine research centers. The Smithsonian has facilities in seven states, the District of Columbia, the Republic of Panama, and over 6,000 employees. We conduct research in more than 100 countries. Smithsonian Enterprises operates retail, media, product development, licensing, and other services that promote the Smithsonian mission while generating essential unrestricted funding for the institution. These include museum stores, theaters, restaurants and cafes, mail order and online catalogs, book publishing, an award-winning television channel, and an award-winning magazine. By providing products and services that draw from the Smithsonian collection, and the research and scholarship of our curators and scientists, Smithsonian Enterprises plays a critical role in advancing the institution's mission, the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Smithsonian Enterprises is self-sustaining. It does not receive Federal appropriations. The Smithsonian offers food services in nine museums and national, then the National Zoo. These consist of restaurants, cafes, and food carts operated by three independent contractors known as concessioners. Smithsonian Enterprises oversees the concession contracts at the museum, and the Friends of the National Zoo, FONS, oversees the concession contracts at the National Zoo. The concessioners pay the Smithsonian a percentage of their sales, and the concessioners are responsible for hiring, managing food service staff purchasing all food supplies, and meeting performance standards established by their contracts. 
The Smithsonian is proud of the variety of food that we that served at our museums in the zoo. The Smithsonian Food Service provides food and beverage to approximately 20 percent of our 30 million visitors each year. The variety of offerings range from a hamburger and fries to cedar plank salmon cooked on an open fire pit at the National Museum of the American Indian. Um, these, the menu is designed to appeal to children, families, and adults from the United States and abroad. If you have any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Thank you. We will get back to you for questions. We'll go to Mr. Paul Worley, the Rail Division Director of North Carolina Transportation Rail Division. Thank you, and you're recognized. Uh, Chairman Micah, Ranking Member Connolly, and members of the subcommittee, I'm pleased to have the opportunity today to come before you and discuss North Carolina's state-supported intercity passenger rail program, our Piedmont and Carolinian services, and use of vending machines to provide food service aboard most of our trains. I'm Paul Worley, direct Rail Division Director with North Carolina Department of Transportation. We began operation of the Carolinian Passenger Train Service in May of 1990 using Amtrak-owned equipment. This route operates between Charlotte, Greensboro, Raleigh, Washington, and New York. In May 1995, the state-supported Raleigh to Charlotte Piedmont was added. Amtrak equipment was not available for this service, so NCDOT acquired its own, rehabbing used coaches and locomotives for half the cost of new equipment. Both services have enjoyed tremendous success. Over the past 10 years, ridership on the Piedmont service has grown from just under 40,000 riders in 2003 to over 170,000 riders in 2013. A second daily round trip was added in June 2010. I have a first slide I want to show you as I talk about our inner city rail passenger service has evolved as we improve safety and rail infrastructure and reduce travel times. For the first seven years of the Piedmont service, 1995 to 2002, NCDOT offered a traditional cafe, hot food and beverage service. The car was staffed with one full-time employee of a private sector food and beverage service contractor. NCDOT competitively bid the Piedmont food and beverage service. While this service was very popular with passengers, it was also very expensive to operate and maintained. And because we served hot meals, the State Health Department ru uh, ruled it a rolling restaurant, and therefore we had to comply with all the state regulations. Next slide, please. Staffing the car with good, reliable employees every day was the most challenging aspect of our service. During an average year, this service with hot food cost NCDOT approximately $350,000 after sales revenues were applied to labor and product and maintenance costs. This loss simply was not sustainable. With this expense and reduction of travel time, food service on the Piedmont was temporarily modified to include a limited self-serve uh, menu of complimentary coffee, beverages, and snacks. Next slide. After much in-house research and surveying of passengers, NCDOT decided the most cost-effective and efficient food and beverage service for the Piedmont would be self-service vending machines. So we modified our cafe cars. We had two state-owned full-size snack machines installed and two beverage machines installed. And we also installed self-service coffee and a bottled water display refrigerator. Next slide. Now, since transferring or transitioning to a vending machine service, significant cost savings have been realized. The machines have been uh, shown to be very reliable with minimal downtime. We converted the cars, and that cost around $750,000 each. And costs associated with the bottled water and the coffee are covered by a 50 cent surcharge added to each Raleigh to Charlotte quarter ticket. Next slide. Beyond the initial capital cost, NCDOT's Piedmont snack and beverage service is now paying for itself. Based on re recent analysis, revenue average is about $2,700 per month, and supplies and maintenance cost around $2,000 per month. But don't tell anyone we're making money. <laughs> While we made these food service changes, our ridership has grown by 27 per 279 percent from 2004 to 2013 since initiating vending machine service in 2009, ridership has grown by 248 uh, percent. However, it must be noted that the second daily round trip of the Piedmont was added in 2010, and that has driven much of this growth. While the Piedmont success story is one that we are very pleased with, we currently rely on Amtrak's food service on the Carolinian, which is a much longer route of 704 miles. While we do not feel that vending machine service is appropriate for such a long route, we do believe there may be opportunities for efficiencies and improved service. Based on our current agreement with Amtrak that is based on the new PREA Section 209 methodology, we estimate that food service losses on the Carolinian for FFY 2014 
uh, are believed to total around $500,000. And as a state supported service, we have to pay for that. Food service is just one area in North Carolina has taken efforts to improve our service and find more efficient and less costly ways to provide pasture amenities. In the coming year, we will commission studies to find more efficiencies and enterprising opportunities for our state supported services. We have been a national leader in crossing safety, constructing rail improvements, and providing passenger service with high customer satisfaction. We will continue to develop those services to exceed customer expectations. I appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony on these issues. The States have innovated and have tried to meet the needs of our customers. While we all can learn, not, only one, not all one size fits all. Thank you. <laughs> Very accurate right down to the second. Thank you. <clears throat> we will hear now from uh, uh, Mr. Dwayne Bateman, and he is Vice General Chairman of uh, Unite Here Local 43. Welcome, and you are recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chairman Micah, Ranking Member Conley, and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to come here today and speak on behalf of Amtrak Food and um, Beverage Service Workers. My name is Dwayne Bateman. I am a lead service attendant currently working on Amtrak's Northeast Corridor between Washington and New York City. I am also Vice General Chairman for Unite Here Local 43, which represents many onboard service workers. I have been in onboard service for over 35 years, working virtually every position uh, associated with this service and on numerous trains. When you work on board, on board Amtrak trains, you have to be trained and able to respond to every type of emergency. You can't call 911 on a train traveling across the Mojave Desert or the Great Plains. If somebody has a heart attack, we have to save their life. If there is a derailment, we have to evacuate the train. If there is a terrorist on board, it is our job to take action. We are trained and we are ready to respond. Here is another fact about working on Amtrak, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, here's another fact about working aboard Amtrak train. It is extremely grueling. Let's say someone working in California Zephyr between Chicago and North Carolina, uh, Northern California. That's a six-day round trip assignment where they work 84 hours practically on their feet the entire time. The shortest work day lasts 10 hours, and there are three days where they work 17 hours or more uh, per day. Anyone who works on onboard service knows the back, what backbreaking labor feels like. No one is more acutely aware of the pressures facing Amtrak than the service workers who devote themselves to caring for our passengers. And now the Inspector General says we earn too much. And to justify this, in his report he made comparisons to the Down Easter, which only lasts eight hours round trip and actually does not profit from its food service. He also compared us to tourist trains that don't even operate overnight or have sleeper berths. None of the aforementioned uh, service workers are subject to the arduous conditions or required to meet the stringent emergency and safety training standards as Amtrak employees. Let's be frank. Low-wage food and beverage jobs are completely incompatible with transportation security and good customer service. But rather than playing politics or making un uninformed comparisons, let's be reasonable. If you want to look at the cost of similar types of work, don't look at commuter service or, or tourist railroads. Look at aviation instead. After five years of service, an Amtrak food and uh, beverage worker earns between $24.50 and $28.62 per hour. This is very similar to flight attendants on American, Continental, Delta, Spirit, uh, United and U.S. Airways. Not only do airlines pay the same rates as Amtrak, they also recognize the value in uh, food service. Despite the much publicized decade of cost cutting on airplanes, Amtrak's per passenger food service costs may actually be lower than U.S. airlines. Premium fare passengers expect Amtrak, like other transport operators, to provide food and beverage service as an amenity included in the price of their ticket. While the past decade has seen commercial airlines take extreme measures to cut meal service to their coach passengers, they have committed to recognize that culinary amenities are essential to maintaining competitiveness in the premium market. Some have proposed that the best solution to the ageist riddle of how do you profit from passenger rail or, more specifically, Amtrak passenger rail food service is outsourcing our work and, uh, outsourcing our work, excuse me, and providing corporate subsidies to those uh, same contractors with no promise of well-qualified personnel, a living wage or benefits. Simply put, it isn't fair to Amtrak's onboard service workers or passengers who pay for, expect and deserve safe and reliable service. When I joined Amtrak, I had no expectation 
that this job would make me a rich man, but it's honest and respectable work with long hours. We earn a fair wage. We get railroad retirement pension, which is funded solely by contributions from railroads and their employees. It allowed me to provide for my family, help send my two girls to college, and live a middle class life. I have invested over three, three, uh, three decades in this career. I have worked hard, earned a decent living, and expect to retire with dignity. I urge you, before eliminating good, Amtrak jo good American jobs, consider all who would be adversely affected or devastated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your uh, testimony and thank each of the witnesses. <laughs> Let me yield first uh, uh, five minutes or whatever time you may consume for an opening statement before we get to questions and uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ranking mem member, Mr. Connolly. And I apologize for being late this no morning. I, uh, Everybody, uh, I have three hearings, uh, three more hearings at the same time. It's exactly. just like musical chairs. Thank you. We practice the philosophy on the two committees I belong to that there's no human problem that cannot lend itself to a solution. <laughs> with another hearing. Um, so I thank the Chairman for his understanding. Um, and thank you for holding today's hearing examining Amtrak's food and beverage service operations. In Northern Virginia, which I represent, Amtrak operates one of its signature long distance carriers, the auto train, while injecting over $60 million annually into our local economy. For years, Amtrak supported hundreds of well-paying jobs for Northern Virginia residents, and we are proud of that. We are also here to discuss an Inspector General report which advocates that Amtrak implement a number of efficiency initiatives to help lower the cost of its food and beverage service. Unfortunately, this hearing is likely to focus on just one of those recommendations, and that is that Amtrak institute a pilot project to eliminate middle class jobs performed by dedicated food service workers and long distance trains. I have no doubt that longtime advocates of privatizing or eliminating Amtrak might welcome that recommendation, but I have serious concerns, frankly, with the methodology underlying the controversial privatization proposal. In arriving at a privatization pilot recommendation, the IG's entire analysis seems to consist of comparing the labor cost of Amtrak's long-distance overnight food and beverage service to the labor cost of just three other train lines, two of which are small, daytime-only trains, and a third that is Canadian replete with a labor force that benefits from Canada's national health care system, a subsidized health care system we don't have. Put more simply, the IG compared, I think, apples and oranges to reach a conclusion uh, that I think is of dubious value. It is simply baffling that the IG's report fails to acknowledge that the food and beverage service of the Downeaster, a low-wage train that operates during the day between Boston and Maine, operates at a loss. Since losses in food and beverage service are the main problem supposedly highlighted in the IG's report, failure to acknowledge that the Downeaster's food and beverage losses is quite an oversight, creating a false impression that the Downeaster's low wage labor approach to staffing food and beverage service is a profitable alternative to the current system of Amtrak. The IG seems not to have considered Amtrak's food and beverage service along the Northeast Corridor as a comparison in its analysis. Had the IG included in the comparison the labor costs of Amtrak's Northeast Corridor trains, which are equivalent to the labor costs of its long distance trains, the IG's conclusion about the advantages of contracting out food and beverage labor in Amtrak's long distance trains might be different. Of course, this does not even mention that, unlike the low wage Downeaster, Amtrak's Northeast Corridor trains are profitable. I am at a loss to understand why these and other significant emissions were not contained in the IG's analysis. Amtrak management has committed to improving efficiency in its food and beverage service, and this progress yet to be made. I know the Chairman is going to point that out correctly. With initial reform efforts already yielding positive results, Amtrak has already increased sales revenue from its food and beverage service, recently reporting, and I quote, in inflation-adjusted dollars, Amtrak's food and beverage loss has been cut by $31 million, from $105 million in fiscal year 2006 to a projected $74 million in fiscal 2013. Further, approximately 99 percent of the food and beverage loss is from dining car service in long-distance trains that Congress requires Amtrak to operate by law. Cafe car services across the system, on the other hand, essentially break even or make a positive contribution to the bottom line. To be clear, 
Significant work does remain, and the IGs pointed that out correctly. However, Amtrak management achieved real cost reductions over the past five years, and I believe they deserve the opportunity to fully implement their five-year plan before we start second-guessing it. Furthermore, we must not lose sight of the fact that negative headlines highlighting Amtrak's food and beverage losses from its long-distance trains dining service, uh, nonetheless, overall business is booming. For example, in fiscal year 2013, Amtrak sustained its, its, its steady improvement, achieving a record 31.6 million riders, which also represents Amtrak's 10th annual ridership record out of the last 11 years. In addition, Amtrak's long-distance routes boasted 4.8 million passengers, the best ridership in the last 20 years. Closer to home, my constituents certainly contributed to the Northeast Corridor's second best ridership levels in history, with 11.4 million passengers traveling between Washington and Boston this year. These impressive accomplishments amount to ticket revenues of $2.1 billion for this fiscal year, another record for Amtrak. Clearly, America's support and reliance on passenger rail is alive and well in the 21st century, uh, and it would be regrettable if we try to retard that progress. So I look forward to hearing from the workforce this morning. Mr. Bateman, as a longtime food service worker in Amtrak's long distance route, you have got a unique perspective on how the IG recommendations might impact the food service to the customers uh, and the real world consequences, obviously, for middle class workers. I also want to thank all of our witnesses for their presence here today and Mr. Micah for your ongoing concern about this issue, which legitimately needs to be highlighted, and I thank you for holding the hearing. Well, thank you, Mr. Conley, and thank you for your remarks and analysis of the IG uh, report and uh, your particular take on the situation. What we are going to do now is switch to questions and uh, get right back to you, Mr. Conley. So I will take the first uh, questions. Uh, I guess it was in October that Amtrak sent out a release about uh, a five-year plan uh, to uh, try to eliminate the losses in food services, Mr. Uh, Hall. Uh, do you have a copy of that plan you could provide to the committee? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not have a copy of the plan with me, but uh, uh, we are still in the development of the plan. I uh, talked in my opening statement about the six major principles that that plan uh, will uh, envelop. So when would you anticipate that we will have a uh, a plan, a firm plan to deal with, uh, again, your, your goal of uh, trying to reduce or dramatically, uh, well, dramatically reduce or eliminate the uh, subsidy? Uh, the, like I said, the uh, plan... By the end of the year, uh, January, February? The plan is still uh, being developed right now. Uh, we are assigning accountabilities for certain functions under the plan that, uh, that I spoke of. Uh, we are putting a team together and uh, working with our uh, newly developed uh, business lines as well to, uh, to uh, incorporate that plan. Uh, we should have something available uh, shortly after the first mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Well, uh, we heard Mr. Bateman talk about his uh, service, and uh, we respect that service. We want to make certain that uh, Amtrak employees are adequately compensated, and uh, if we do eliminate routes or positions, we also have labor agreements that need to be adhered to. Is that, that, that would be your assumption, too, right, Mr. Hall? We do have labor agreements with all of our uh, union employees, yes. Now, I know if you eliminate some routes, uh, some of the old labor contracts, I think, uh, gave a five-year uh, sort of, I think there's a, a the payment and also um, uh, pension uh, benefits, and I think some of the newer hires get a three uh, three year uh, payout uh, if you eliminate uh, routes. Does that hold true if you eliminate these positions? Uh, are they compensated? Uh, uh, it, it, it appears that again that uh, something's going to have to be done on the uh, employee side if you go to vendors or if you go to vending machines or uh, another contractor. What happens to the employees? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would be more than happy to check with our Labor Relations Department and get back to the committee on those uh, specifics. I would like to know, because we want to make certain that, uh, again, those uh, commitments are, are kept. And they have a cost, too. I mean, if you buy someone out with a three- or a five-year contract plus their benefits, we'd, 
I think that's very important that we uh, in, ensure that uh, those commitments are kept. Can you get back to the committee and let me know um, uh, how they're affected and uh, what the potential cost was? Because labor is one of your big uh, things. Uh, Mr. Bateman, and I think also the ranking member mentioned, um, well, you mentioned in your testimony the safety training that you receive um, and how, um, I guess that's, um, let me see here, it was in the Inspector General's report to you, uh, Amtrak. Employees receive an initial 21 hours of training in safety and emergency preparedness. After that, they must complete eight hours every two years. Yes, That's sir. what they said. And then we mentioned the Canadian comparison, and I just happened to turn this over and read. In contrast, the Canadian uh, rail, uh, for the Canadian rail passenger railroad, um, the employees there receive um, 24 hours of emergency training annually. Uh, and uh, so it doesn't look like uh, you get the same uh, amount of training uh, that, you, that you cited. Uh, if, I, if I may, sir, um, actually, we're trained in CPR every two years. Uh, and that's part of our training. But emergency preparedness is annually. And it's mm -hmm. an eight-hour class uh, mm -hmm. annually. Well, they get 24. They get 24, yes, sir. So, so I just thought I'd... Uh, include that for the record. Uh, the credit card uh, issue, uh, again, every time we hold these hearings, whether it's transportation or other committees, issue, uh, we're still in a pilot. We do not have that complete for a cashless system with um, a food service, Mr. Hall. Uh, we did implement onboard credit card transactions in 2006, shortly after the House but and I foods, Committee. But food service is not complete. Well, that is for food service. We do have onboard credit card availability. We are right now in the final stages of piloting a point of sale system on board our trains uh, and the fully integrated model, which is scheduled for delivery from the vendor uh, at the conclusion of this year, will have the integrated credit card functionality into for, the For all team. food service on, on uh, Amtrak? Uh, that will be in our lounge car operations. But at that so it's time, not, we can pilot the cashless sales. So it's not, again, you're telling me it's partial. It's not no, complete the, uh, for uh, food service or plan to be complete. Well, the POS system is applicable to our lounge and cafe car services. Our dining car services require a different service model, and there's a different technology solution for those. Uh, someone came to me and said that they can pay for their uh, vegetables at the weekend market uh, with their uh, credit card. Uh, again, this goes on for year after year, and we still do not have uh, this implemented. And uh, I don't want to get into the details of some of the losses we've experienced in the past. Uh, again, I just don't think that's acceptable, uh, either not having a written five-year plan at this juncture or uh, plan for implementation to deal with the um, uh, with credit card purchases. Uh, let me ask you this: We'd asked before about uh, the big losses are uh, on the long distance services. Is that correct, Mr. Hall, of, for food service? That is correct. Sir. Yeah, and most of those are serve meals. We had some menus uh, that we looked at. Uh, you had a, this gourmet chef's conclave uh, that has met. Uh, I don't think you pay those chefs, but uh, have you been able to provide either our committee or the Transportation Committee with information about the cost of those uh, conclaves? Uh, I believe that we have, sir. Okay, and how much is that? Uh, I believe in the last year the total expense at Amtrak borne for the Amtrak Culinary Advisory Team was approximately $49,000. Okay. Um, we uh, also um, look at the, uh, again, the uh, supposed uh, uh, reductions in losses, uh, which uh, over from 2006 to 2012, you report uh, $33 million, a reduction in losses. And uh, it appears from the report from the Inspector General that you've actually just 
transferred money from ticket, uh, some tickets uh, uh, to uh, uh, the food and service account, uh, and that uh, accounts for about 66 uh, percent of the uh, change in the losses. So we're going from one set of losses to another set of losses. Is that what's happening, Mr. Hall? Uh, I think Mr. Alves might want to comment on you that. That was in his report. Okay. Um, we, we, oh, sorry. Um, what we reported was an increase in revenue and a reduction in costs. Um, a significant amount of the increase in revenue came from higher volumes as opposed to a change in the accounting process. The one change in the accounting process uh, was on the Northeast Corridor, um, where during that time Amtrak uh, made an adjustment in how food and beverage is priced in the Northeast Corridor. Uh, the cost reductions, the most significant cost reduction, as I recall, uh, is reawarding the commissary contract uh, that reduced costs by about four and a half million dollars in spite of a significant increase in volume. Uh, so that was a, a, a real cost, cost reduction. And a significant portion of the re revenue is real revenue increases. Well, again, it says here 22.1 million increase uh, transfers from ticket revenues. Uh, so most of that um, difference between 22 and 32 is from transfers uh, on tickets. Uh, what Amtrak does on the long distance routes is uh, they well, include they include yeah, they in have the first included, class yeah they have included some cost for meals, but what right. I'm saying is again uh, with the overall loss every ticket on Amtrak and the more tickets we sell we're up to thirty uh, thirty what did you say thirty one million passengers. Mm -hmm. Every ticket subsidized with a, a fed, uh, federal, uh, again, subsidy of $1.3 billion, do the math, nearly $40. So, again, we're, uh, we're losing uh, money on the t uh, tickets. The Sunset Unlimited, which we use as an example, they, lo they lose $404 per ticket, not counting. Well, within that, I guess you have $55 loss for food service. Right. Increased revenue does not equate to it's like, yeah. a profit. Yes. And Mr. Uh, Meadows is gone, but he says if you're selling the watermelons uh, at uh, a loss, if you continue that, uh, uh, you expand your loss. Uh, Mr. Conley, we'll go to you now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and you've just touched on a fascinating subject. Mr. Alves, I have to go easy on you. You're a fellow Bostonian and you <laughs> like the Red Sox. So. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. You're a brilliant man. Uh, but talking about subsidies, does Canada subsidize its real service? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that. Um, Pretty good guess? Um, I would not be surprised. Are you aware of any major industrialized country that does not subsidize its real service? Uh, no, I'm not. Right. So I think there is something in Japan that I've heard. Um, but, and the subsidy is uh, both operating and uh, infrastructure as well. Well, I've, I've taken the bullet train from Tokyo to down south in Japan, and um, I'm pretty sure it's subsidized. I'd Gr accept that. I've taken the ground B test in Europe. It's subsidized. And by the okay. way, wonderful service as a result. Mm -hmm. Great food service. Uh, it's a great way to go from Paris to Brussels or vice versa. But it's all subsidized. Um, so, I mean, now we're going to talk about not whether they're you can make a train service viable without a subsidy. All viable train services, major trains, you know, train services in industrialized countries require subsidies to be viable. And of course, there are other forms of transportation too, which of course my, my good friend, Mr. Mike, is very aware of. I mean, if we want to talk about subsidies for Amtrak, maybe we could talk about subsidies for rural airports in America and look at how viable that is. If you want to look at a ticket subsidy, it makes this pale by comparison, of course. So it really does depend what we're talking about. We can't only talk about this stuff you know, sort of out of context. Could you answer the concern I raised that when you talked about the Don Easter, you kind of failed in your report to mention it operates at a loss? Yes, I actually. Well, why, why that oversight? Uh, I think we properly qualified our report uh, in addressing uh, those issues. And what we said was that the comparison, 
there is not a direct comparison of those examples to Amtrak, but there are similarities. The similarity on the Down Easter is that it's a cafe car. Yeah. Uh, Amtrak runs cafe cars on the long distance routes uh, and on in the Northeast Corridor. But wouldn't it have been wouldn't it have been useful for someone to understand, in full disclosure, that you're citing it as an example and that it operates at a loss? Now we could have included that. We didn't think it was relevant. Um, and I think the reason is that th the difference in cost is still there. The, well, it's an, it's an order of magnitude difference in cost. Right. I, and I understand your reasoning. I, I would just respectfully suggest, though, since the subject here is operating at a profit, operating at a loss, how much of a loss, how much of a loss is desirable, what are some models we can look to, uh, I think it would have been a useful thing for the IG's report in full disclosure mm -hmm. to point out that looking at that particular alternative, it also operates at a loss. Um, Mr. Bateman, you made a point about comparing sort of the labor, the intensive labor effort in long distance, you know, carrying uh, more to the airlines really than, say, a, a short haul, uh, you know, on the East Coast or, or somewhere. Um, and you talked about a six day sort of commitment and turnaround and actually very labor intensive long hours when you're on the train because you can't kind of, you know, get off. Uh, you, you, you've got to be serving the customers. Um, how important do you think food service is in long distance trips like that uh, for the service to continue to attract customers? I, I think it's critical. I can't imagine someone uh, riding on a train overnight with uh, vending machines and uh, that sort of thing. I don't think it would be feasible. Uh, but if I could address one point that Mr. Alves talked about a second ago about the uh, uh, Down Easter service, comparing it to uh, our service. Cafe car to cafe car, our cafe cars are making money. The Down Easter is not operating a profit. You compare the Down Easter to a dining car, of course, it's unfair comparison. Again, apples and oranges. Good point. Um, and Mr. Worley, you, you talked about the North Carolina experience, but I, I took to heart what you said, though. You had a, a very important caveat, which is we can't approach this as one size fits all. Uh, yes, sir. You, you are correct there. Um, one of the notes I'll make is we have it on both sides with the Carolinian being 704 miles. So we do experience uh, on the food service with the Carolinian that there is a loss yeah. with that. And that's a loss that is billed to us and voiced to us uh, from Amtrak that the states have to pick that up. So we feel that and, and see, the, see the need to really look at some good options there. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Howell, um, you're representing Smithsonian. Do you ride Amtrak? I have ridden Amtrak, yes. Uh, and, and, and is it your view, by virtue of your being here in your testimony, that you think uh, Amtrak could emulate Smithsonian's outsourcing of food services, that it's a good model for them to look at? Um, I, th I really am not someone that can judge that from their complexity of their business compared to what I have to run. I think the transportation business is quite different than what okay. I'm involved in. So, so you're, I shouldn't construe your presence here uh, uh, you know, to mean anything other than Smithsonian is a wonderful institution and has some interesting food services and thought you'd want to know about them. I would agree with you. Okay. Thank you very much. That's very important. Um, and Mr. Hall, you would agree with that, that they are different services and therefore, well, obviously there might be something to be learned clearly from Smithsonian's experience. It's not a model for a transportation system like Amtrak, as no, Mr. Howell just said. Yeah, I, I don't think it's a, it's a viable model. A, a brick and mortar establishment versus the uh, onboard services onboard train are, are quite different. Right. I, I read in my opening statement some extraordinary statistics because as I was, I hadn't really, you know, my good friend, Mr. Micah, is an expert in transportation, chaired the transportation committee. I had wanted to be on the transportation committee, but I didn't get appointed to it. Uh, I'm not bitter or anything, but, uh, uh, but uh, so I had to do a little homework on Amtrak coming here, and I was surprised by record number, record profit, you know, record uh, revenue. Um, to what do you ascribe uh, the, the uh, seeming success in the numbers of Amtrak? What, what, why are we hitting records in volume of ridership and, in some cases, revenue? 
Uh, rail is, in, is increasingly popular. It's economical. Uh, it's environmentally friendly. Um, it is uh, something that the consumers are uh, actively pursuing at this time, uh, especially uh, many of the younger consumers. How important is the quality of food service, from your point of view, to maintaining those record numbers? Uh, we have done some research on that, sir. Um, for instance, on our, on our long-distance services, uh, if we were to eliminate the dining car service and just keep a lounge car type of operation on those trains, we would lose $93 million in ticket revenue. In other words, those passengers value this amenity. They right. value it greatly. So sometimes in business we have a concept called loss leader. Sometimes you have to have a loss leader in order to get the wider customer revenue. So you may or may not break even on a particular food service, but it's essential if you're going to maintain the ridership. That's essentially what you're telling us. Absolutely. We, we actually saw that on our Excel Express service back in, I believe it was 2005, where we uh, significantly reduced the food and beverage services. We eliminated our hot entrees, which are very popular with our passengers, and replaced it with basically a, a basket of a, a very nice gourmet sandwich and chips and, and water. And the erosion in ridership, the defection from first class to business class was so significant that the loss in ticket revenue far outweighed the savings that we made in the reduced food and beverage offerings. So, so you've got to look at that. And Mr. Alvis, I assume the IG recognizes that relationship as well. Yes, we yeah. do. Now, and final, my final question um, uh, is following up on what Mr. Micah was getting at, which is, okay, but there's still progress to be made, obviously, in the cost of food service and in making it easier for customers to access that food service, like credit cards. And I, I wonder, I want to give you the opportunity, Mr. Hall, to just bring us up to date on what's ahead in terms of progress we can look forward to. Yeah, absolutely, sir. And, and many of the uh, items that Mr. Alves and the uh, OIG brought up in their report, those are the actions that we are taking, those incremental improvements to food and beverage uh, as far as the onboard logistics, uh, optimizing our product development and supply chain, implementing additional technologies. Uh, we are looking at certain areas in labor where we can optimize the workforce, where we can use it more efficiently, where we can manage that workforce uh, effectively to the demand on that, on that train. Uh, and if I can clarify, please, that we do accept credit cards on all of our trains for our food service. We simply have not implemented a cashless pilot because we, the existing technology and POS will not allow that at this time. When we receive the final delivery of the fully integrated solution, we can pilot the cashless. But we do accept credit cards on all of our food service cards nationwide. And you're moving toward a cashless system? That is correct, sir, and we hope to implement that or pilot that shortly after the beginning of next year. Hmm. Okay. Well, you'll make my young staff happy. I still use cash. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. To all Mr. of you. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, and I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, one of my concerns is always the worker. The people who live in my district are the people who clean the trains. They're the ones who take care of the folks' beds in the hotels. And we have gotten so far away now, and we spend so much time making sure that business makes big money, that the worker is making less and less and less. And there's something about quality of life that concerns me. And that leads me to you, Mr. Bateman. Among many cost-saving measures recommended by the Inspector General, a critical one is a pilot initiative to test the privatization of Amtrak's food and beverage service. As a 36-year Amtrak worker, what effect would privatization have on you your employment and the livelihood of Amtrak food service workers. And can you tell us a, a little bit about these workers? Can you give us a typical worker, education, whatever? Okay. Uh, for the most part, people do these jobs um, uh, because they want to take care of their families. This is a very arduous job, and no one would do this without 
having somebody behind you that you're responsible for. Uh, the, the hours are grueling. The days are very long. Uh, our typical employee, I guess, has an average high school diploma. Uh, we have some, uh, though, have PhDs. Uh, there are different levels of education. But as far as the effect of contracting out, I mean, I think it will lower our wages probably significantly, maybe in half. And I can't see anyone surviving, especially in this area, off of $12.50 an hour. Um, and so what will be the um, so what about insurance? Do they have insurance now? We have insurance now, uh -huh. but I don't see that happening if we have a contractor uh, if it's contracted out. I don't see uh, insurance being part of the package. Um, did you, did you um, Inspector General, did you consider insurance when you were going through your analysis? Uh, yes, we did. We considered the benefits uh, provided both to Amtrak and the contractors. Because so often what we've seen in the past, and I know we have the Affordable Care Act, which the Republicans are trying to destroy, but we have that. But the fact is that I've noticed that a lot of times uh, workers either have no insurance doing these jobs or, I mean, when they, when they contract out, that is, contract out, have pitiful insurance, if any. And so somebody's, my father, who was a former sharecropper with a second grade education, used to say, somebody's going to pay. So the question is, who pays here when you, if we contract out, is what I've seen is that the company makes, the, the, the contractor makes a lot of money, um, the uh, employee makes less money, less benefits. As a matter of fact, my mother-in-law, was working and uh, for the federal government, she was sitting beside uh, somebody who was making far less with less benefits, doing the same job, by the way, but they were working for the contractor. So, did I mean, just tell me how you, about your analysis and the worker, you know, the the the, the nuts and bolts person. Yeah, we did uh, uh, compare uh, uh, wages and benefits. And you're right that the, in the private sector, uh, there are uh, very few benefits. Um, a couple had no benefits. They got the salaries. Um, one had, um, and this- You're talking about contractors, is that it? The contractors, right. yes. Get no benefits. Right. Um, and so your point is completely valid. So when, when we look at this, Ms. Alves, um, have you compared the labor costs on Amtrak with those on commuter railroads in the United States that provide inner city passenger service and whose employees generally view their employment as a career than, rather than a seasonal occupation such as a Long Island Railroad or the Metro North? If not, if you didn't, why didn't you? But it, did you? No, we didn't. Uh, we were looking specifically at an alternative of contracting out and within that, specifically at the differences in labor costs. And so, Mr. Alves, should we rely on the comparison of the three trains in your report as the sole basis for eliminating good uh, paying jobs? And I go back, and I, did I hear you right, Mr. Bateman, when you said that your folks are making a profit? And the Down Easter, you said, is not making a profit? Did I, you didn't so, say that, did you? Actually, what I said was he made a comparison from the Down Easter to our dining cars. Okay. Not uh, Down Easter, which is a cafe car service, to our cafe cars. Mm -hmm. Cafe mm -hmm. car to cafe car, as they testified earlier, we make a profit or break even. Mm -hmm. The Down Easter, from my understanding, from the data I've seen, that Down Easter is, is not making a profit. Mm -hmm. And they're paying $10 an hour. So I don't see what the benefit is. Now, yeah, Mr. Alves? I'd like to respond to your, where you were going in your first yeah. question, whether this is a sole basis for deciding to contract out. Mm -hmm. And I think we were very clear in the report, and I would like to clarify it uh, right now, that we don't consider that the, to be the sole basis. We consider it to be an indicator uh, that it should be looked at carefully. We identified a number of things that continue to be uncertain, including the safety role, uh, the applicability of some of the benefits, railroad retirement, FELA uh, benefits, uh, and the impact on uh, the workforce. Mm -hmm. Amtrak uh, is a long-term employer, has a long-term uh, relationship with, with these employees. All of that needs to be considered. 
I would add one other factor, uh, which is that we think it is very important that Amtrak address the inefficiencies that exist in the food and beverage. Uh, we identified six of those. We think that that is a sample rather than the complete amount of inefficiency. And it, I, we suggest, based on best practices, that Amtrak address those um, before it decides to contract out. Last but not least, Mr. Uh, Hall, um, you, I take it that you, you, want, you want a chance to do that, do those things that they have recommended? Or you disagree with them or what? Uh, absolutely. Uh, and what's, what's, how long have you known about these recommendations? Uh, we received the report. I believe it was report, uh, issued uh, at the end of October. Okay. Um, and the, uh, the, uh, all of the recommendations that are in the report for incremental improvement are included in our plan, plus additional incremental improvements that Amtrak already has uh, uh, underway. And you are trying to execute? We are trying to execute those. And uh, What is stopping you? What would save the 10 uh, to do the incremental improvements, nothing is stopping us. We are uh, actively engaged. We have uh, work ongoing. Uh, we have just completed our reorganization uh, of the company, and I am actively engaged uh, with our business line general managers in addressing the food and beverage loss. Do you have a timetable? Uh, do you have a timetable? In the next five years. Sir. The only reason I ask that, Mr. Chairman, is that you know, one of the things that I've noticed is that a lot of times if you don't set a timetable and you don't set deadlines, nothing happens or well, it doesn't happen timely. And so, I mean, if you've got a timetable, I'd like to see it. Uh, if you can get that to us, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would, would my friend yield? Of course. Uh, just, just for one clarification, Mr. Hall, in response to the distinguished ranking member's question about do you embrace the recommendations of the IG report, I, I, I want to make give you the opportunity to be accurate. I assume you do not embrace the recommendation about a pilot project to eliminate food service and long distance trains. We do not agree to right. eliminate food service. Just want to make no, that very clear. Thank you, Mr. Hall. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Cummings. Well, uh, okay, we'll go to another quick round here. Uh, first of all, uh, Mr. Howell, um, you are a government operation. Um, and uh, I guess you come on, on, actually, you come under the jurisdiction our, of our committee. You do provide food service. Uh, does that food service turn a profit? It does. It does. How much, uh, just estimate? Uh, $9 million in 2003, fiscal year 2003. How many visitors did you have? Um, uh, we served about what we call covers, which would have been more than the visitors there, but about uh, 6 million people. Okay. I brought him here, one, because they are under our jurisdiction, the committee specifically, our sub subcommittee too. They do provide this service, they do a great job, and they return a profit. Not that it is exactly comparable to a, a transportation food service. Mr. Worley, um, you were losing more money and you are losing less money, is that right? Yes, sir, that is okay. correct. And I brought you here because you have had uh, loss problem. It is a State subsidized. The State is picking up the subsidy. How much is the um, indebtedness of North Carolina, do you know? Uh, we, have a, we have a balanced budget uh, and a constitutional okay. amendment. Okay. We have a slight difference. We are at $17 trillion and going upwards. Um, I am one of the, I'm the strongest advocate for passenger rail in the United States Congress. There is no one that will uh, compare with me. I want to expand it. I think uh, we have, we're, I think we are in the Neanderthal stage as far as the country. As far as employment, I have always guaranteed labor people, their be uh, benefits, um, anything that is committed to them and maintain that even in future service. Now, you told me, uh, for example, you increased your um, Ridership was at 40,000 to what? It was 300 and some percent, 40,000 to 170 or something? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, since uh, we initialized the. Uh, so, did that require hiring any additional employees to service that many people? No, sir. You didn't? So, you did it within your, your uh, existing thing? Did you diminish anybody's wages or anything or benefits? No, sir. Okay. All right. Um, and, but the state picked up the differences in, in the losses. 
And uh, I, I have no problem with subsidizing uh, transportation at reasonable subsidization, but always at the lowest cost to the taxpayer, which you were trying to achieve. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Okay. Okay. I, I, and the reason we, we did this is that uh, I didn't uh, ask for this report. I asked for a lot of tough reports, but this was produced. And you actually produced uh, in your report some ways that they could save money, right? Uh, yes. And one yes. of those, too, is assigning cost appropriately, getting the money in. Uh, overall, I'd like to reduce the loss on some of these routes. Is that, that's not, I don't think, an unreasonable request. Um, you gave me your priorities. You, don't you didn't come to the committee with a written plan. Uh, that was October when you said you had a plan. There is not a written plan. You had an outline of some things. Obviously, uh, one of your second... Um, your second uh, point is labor optimization, uh, and that is also in your report. Now, there may be some reduction in uh, some number of employees uh, when you optimize that. Um, that would pro might, might happen. Mr. Uh, Inspector General, would you? Uh, the that's a, a possibility, possibility, yes. But I think and it would I can't, probably... Okay, it, it's a possibility. And Mr. Bateman, you came here as a strong advocate of having worked a long time and uh, paid your dues and all and speaking on behalf of those that are employed. And I asked the question of what would happen if we lose some of these people. He can't, uh, Mr. Hall can't answer. That's not acceptable. A uh, representative from Amtrak needs to know what the policies they propose or the... Uh, are, uh, or advocate uh, for making changes will infect their employees. So I think that's very important. I want you to get back with the committee. I want to know how these employees are going to be affected because, uh, again, I've, I've always made that commitment to labor and will continue that uh, even as we make the transition. So if some uh, positions have to be eliminated, consolidated, or whatever, uh, I need to know the impact of that. Uh, let me just talk about... Uh, uh, we're f I said we're falling further behind. Yes, there are transportation systems and rail that make money. Uh, Virgin Rail, for nearly 10 years, when they privatized some of the rail in England, went from a $300 uh, million a year subsidy by the UK to a $100 million profit. Uh, the the, uh, the uh, European Union has... Uh, has uh, an edict that uh, by 2015, the passenger rail in Europe, the state uh, operations, must also compete. Italy's already had one competition open. Ferrari took a line and uh, makes money on operations, uh, and I would in include that to, to also be food service. Also, uh, while the government has had to subsidize in Germany and Japan and other areas, uh, the infrastructure, and I strongly support that, shame on us for the Northeast Corridor, the shape it's in. We should be investing in that. We should have two-hour service between here and New York or less, and we should have triple the number of employees working uh, there at your uh, union uh, rates or whatever with those benefits. It's a shame that we don't uh, do that. And we would also uncongest our air corridors uh, in the, the northeast quarter by doing that and catch up with the rest of the world. So, and I, I, I just heard that there's a group, uh, Rendell and some others are putting together. I'd like to haul those folks in and find out what they're proposing to see about uh, getting that service going. Yeah. But public-private partnerships can work. We can increase employment. Then the biggest carrier isn't the airlines. Uh, they only carry about seven or 800 million passengers a year. It's actually uh, long-distance bus, bus service. We don't sur subsidize one meal on that. Some of those are long routes. Uh, they're on the stock exchange. They make money, that, that, but they move more people in this country at a very reasonable uh, rate. So please don't tell me you can't do it. Not not that a bus is a rail and all of that. So those are a couple points I wanted to make. Now, the other thing, too, is uh, I see in some news reports highlighted, and I didn't cover it. I'm not picking on you as much as some of these guys. But uh, in your report, there's the uh, complimentary items on, uh, on um, 
auto train, and that service is into my district. About two hundred and sixty thousand dollars in complimentary wine, cheese, uh, a champagne. Uh, I mean, we have to look at some ways uh, for me to tell people when they're sending their hard-earned dollars, they get we're getting them further in debt and borrowing forty-three cents on a dollar. Uh, somehow, some of this uh, has to be revised. So the, the purpose of this hearing is to look at where we can cut costs, do a better job, and bring that down. I held hearings before, back some years, and you cited those, uh, and we were losing $100 uh, million, uh, a year. Uh, 72 is this year, or uh, I guess 2012. And I want to see uh, that number come down. I think you have some good recommendations. We'll help you uh, implement. Uh, and uh, I do want to see also uh, these uh, these six. I think you had six major proposals for reducing the cost in your plan uh, presented to the committee as soon as possible. You're going to do that, Mr. Hall. Any Thank estimate you well, when you can get it to us? I believe I said uh, shortly after the first of the year, we'll try to get you the first. Okay, report. we'll give you it's to the. It's going to be a dynamic plan. It's in okay. development, and uh, and it'll be in development. I give you the to the end of February, and then we'll do another hearing. Okay. Chairman Yu, yes. Just one question, Mr. Chairman. You uh, said something just a moment ago that I was just wondering about. Um, you were saying um, that the bus services uh, are doing extremely well. Um, and I think that's, I mean, I'm just trying to see what the comparison is. I mean, I, it has, well, uh, it's been a while since I rode a bus we were, long, a long gonna, distance. Uh, Mr. Oh, uh, Conley said, was, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe you weren't here, we were talking no, about transportation services making money. And so I cited three or four rail that I know of. Mm -hmm. And again, with a, a subsidization of infrastructure in the past, they subsidized operations, but there's been turnaround. I, I, thought, you were, hoping, I thought you were aiming at food services. I, I, I'm sorry. I thought you would just no no okay, no. Fine. I'm talking about, uh, but uh, again, you can make the comparison. Uh, most, well, I don't know. Some of them may may sell something now on mega buses and others, uh, mm. which have taken over huge markets. I've been on a couple of those, and uh, there are there are uh, they go more to the vending uh, service model that was. You do that often, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you'd be surprised. I'm probably one of the few uh, members, too, that come, sometimes flies in and takes the bus, Route 41, uh, and uh, uh, ho home. And actually, I've announced some, when we used to have uh, earmarks, and of late, I've announced some grants uh, from the back of the bus. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's a great experience. <laughs> and I just held a big transportation conference or participated one in central Florida uh, advocating expansion of mass transit right. and asked how many people, there were about 400 people in the audience, how many came by public trans, transportation. I think maybe two or three raised their hand. And that's another thing that we've advocated is working with rail to connect with bus for 15 damn years. They told me we couldn't do it at U Union Station. We did it in 15 months because uh, passengers who ride rail or bus uh, should not be second-class citizens, have to drag their, their, uh, their luggage down the street in rain, sleet, co cold, and heat, uh, and not have an intermodal facility that is taxpayer-supported. We help put a lot of money in that place. But you go there, and I'll give you a, a dozen other locations across the country where we're bringing uh, now, um, again, people together. People in this country will use mass transit if it's accessible uh, and it's convenient. Unaffordable. But uh, you have them sit uh, uh, for a bus stop or a train stop on an overturned shopping cart or, uh, again, uh, inconvenience or not having the access, uh, they won't use it. So, again, I try to, be, uh, I try to offer positive solutions, and I think working together we can do that. But this is important. We're, we're going, we're in a very serious financial situation, and uh, uh, while I bust your chop sometimes, uh, it's meant to improve uh, the service because uh, uh, we can and we must do better. Uh, Mr. Conley. Mr. Chairman, um, first of all, let me, uh, for the record, thank you for your support for transit. Um, my uh, region, Northern Virginia, has been a beneficiary of your support. 
uh, for the Silver Line extension of uh, rail, rail to Dulles. And I, I, we, we know that. You know, I certainly personally am deeply appreciative and, and was before I even came to Congress. And so your advocacy is something very important. And it's so great to hear you talk about uh, uh, trying to make investments in the Northeast Corridor so it looks like a 21st century uh, <laughs> rail system instead of what it is. Uh, and I agree with you. I think the goal ought to be a two-hour train ride to, to New York. I'd never fly again to New York if we could do that. Um, and I, I wish we would and could. So I, I happily will join you anytime you'd like in trying to make those investments happen because I think they're really critical. Uh, and I think they would be very important for the competitive posture, frankly, of this country. You look at other, you know, I was just in Taiwan two years ago. I was, and I've been there many times, and I was stunned at the bullet train they, they built. And it didn't take 50 years to do it. And, uh, and, and your point about subsidies certainly is well taken. I was only trying to make the point that, you know, for most large transit systems and rail systems, subsidies are a very commonplace thing in Asia, Europe, and, and here in North America. Uh, and you are quite right. The principle should be, well, let's try to get the subsidy down to the lowest possible level we can get it uh, so that we're maximizing benefit. Um, but per se, a subsidy doesn't indicate something good or bad. I will say that when the federal – well, let me ask you, Mr. Hall, uh, talk to us about your federal funding. Um, what's happened to Amtrak federal funding in the last, oh, I don't know, three or four years? Uh, the, uh, the amount of federal funding for our operations, our operating budget, has been reduced year over year. Could I, you don't, I don't have those exact numbers with me. I wouldn't be uh, qualified to speak to that. Mr. Alves, do you know those figures? I do know that the operating subsidy has been going down, but I don't have them either. Dramatic? Modest? Um, uh, reasonably well. Um, I wouldn't say dramatic. I, somewhere in between, maybe. Yeah, not trivial, though. Re reasonable, yes. Right, right. Yeah. Significant. Right. And, and, you know, we were listening to Mr. Worley talk about subsidies in North Carolina going down, but profit and ridership going up. Is that correct? Uh, actually, uh, with the uh, with the 209 that we're going through, while our ridership has gone up and our revenues are going up, the cost has has been more cost is being allocated to the states. Okay, so they're paying a little bit more. Yes, sir. We're having to pay more. Right, right. Which we mandate. But I, I would only point that as Amtrak subsidies are going down. Yes, our, they have our, also managed to have increases in ridership. In fact, record ridership, and increases in revenue. In fact, record revenue. Is that, that correct? That's correct, sir. All right. So, I mean, they're, they're doing that bit, too. I, I would just end on, because this is something the Chairman and I have in common, but I, uh, I was late this morning because I had to go to a meeting um, to celebrate um, a, a, a transit uh, victory, which is that Phase 1 of Rail to Dulles uh, is going to be opening in, a, in about a month. And, uh, it, and, and it's an interesting lesson. When we built Metro here in Metropolitan Washington, the federal posture in financing that capital construction was 80 percent. So the local localities had to pick up 20 percent, but the Federal Government paid for 80 percent. And we built it, 108-mile system. For the Silver Line extension, which is, I think, the largest transit extension in the United States, from, you know, here to, well, from Falls Church to Dulles Airport, it's about 22-mile extension. The federal participation will not be 80 percent. It will be 16 percent. What are the consequences of that when the government, federal government shrinks from its responsibilities? We are not talking about North Carolina here. We are talking about the nation's capital. We are talking about the premier airport of the nation's capital designated by the federal government as such. What other industrialized capital in the world would say, well, if you think a link, a real link, between your premier airport at the capital and the capital city, you think that's a good idea, I don't know, figure out how to pay for it. You don't think we're going to pay for it. That's how they built it, the rail link from Charles de Gaulle to Paris, right? Or from Narita to Tokyo, or London to Heathrow. Uh, I go on and on. Of course not. But we put the burden on the local government to finance this construction project. No wonder it took so long. It's been from the conception of an idea that, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here, maybe we need a real link 
to this empty airport called Dulles and the capital city, that idea first germinated in 1962. We are now 52 years later, <laughs> and we are opening phase one. Um, and uh, and, and it has you know, been a, a real challenge. And what are the consequences of that retreat from Federal responsibility in terms of investments? We are going to lose a competitive edge with lots of other places on this planet who are willing to make those kinds of investments. So I, I take away from this hearing, we need to be as efficient as we can. And where we can be more efficient, where we can identify more savings, where perhaps some subsidies are no longer justified, great. But re and I know the Chairman shares this philosophy, we must not retreat from critical infrastructure investments if America is going to be competitive for the future. And in many ways, Amtrak in the Northeast Corridor and, frankly, rail right here in the metropolitan area, especially at Dulles Airport, are great uh, case studies of how to do it or how not to do it in terms of the choices uh, presented to us. So I thank you all for being here today, and I thank the Chairman uh, for having this hearing. It is uh, quite thought-provoking. I know we will revisit the issue uh, in, in due time. And I want to also thank Mr. Cummings for his thoughtful participation and his leadership on this committee. Thank the gentleman. Probably in February, um, <laughs> Mr. Cummings. I will be very brief. I uh, also, also want to uh, thank all of you. Um, Mr. Hall, um, the you know I notice I know that um, back in 2006 you had um, food and beverage lost 105 million dollars. Is that that right? Uh, that is correct, sir. And why was that? That's a lot of money. Why was that? Why was that? The the loss in, in yeah yes six? yeah yeah. Um, the, the revenues were not uh, meeting the uh, the uh, uh, targets at that time, and mm -hmm. uh, we uh, had not uh, yet uh, taken a lot of action to optimize the system. Mm -hmm. And and what is it now? Uh, the loss uh, in FY12 was seventy two million dollars. Okay. And and how did you how did you do that? How did you make that reduction? You got to do better than that, but just curious. Yeah, we we took uh, a number of incremental actions. Uh, at the time, we had already outsourced our commissary operations. Uh, we renegotiated the contract uh, with that vendor. Uh, subsequently, we rebid that contract uh, competitively on the open market. Uh, we optimized our supply chain and product development. We brought in more consumer relevant products. We significantly uh, increased our revenues. Uh, that we brought in per passenger. Um, so each one of those steps, and, and it is a number of individual steps that you take, uh, reduce the loss. Do you all have like a um, situation where you get employee suggestions as to how to do business more effectively and efficiently? Uh, you know, like most companies, a lot of companies have that. Well, we do, sir. In fact, uh, right now, uh, as the Chief of Customer Service, I am sponsoring uh, focus groups, uh, employee research uh, on our customer service programs. Uh, okay. And we are uh, partnering with our labor leaders uh, in addressing this, uh, the food and beverage loss as well. Now, Mr. Bateman, if you had an opportunity, I mean, I think, I think everybody understands that um, you want Amtrak to do well. You, you don't want to see them losing money every year. And if you all were to, I mean, if you, were, you all were sitting down, the workers, the union, and said, look, Amtrak, this is what we see that you could be doing better and more efficiently and effectively so that we could have a win-win-win situation, I mean, what would you tell them? I'm just curious. Uh -huh. and, and have you told them whatever you're getting ready to tell me? Well, um, first of all, um, no one's talking about the progress we've made. I mean, since I've been in this company, when I first came here, um, Amtrak was only probably recouping about fifty-five cents on a dollar back in the early seventies, eighties, and right now I think we're getting back about eighty-five percent off a dollar as far as our investment. As far as food service back in those days, uh, in the early 30, 30, 30, 35 years ago. Um, 
excuse me, um, we've improved immensely all our, all, all our uh, efforts to bring the cost down and control um, waste or whatever. And I think they made a lot of progress in that area. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as some suggestions, first of all, I think we need more supervision on the, on the train. As far as direct supervision, uh, they had, with their budget cuts, they had to cut back a lot of that direct supervision. I think that would really help uh, cut our costs. We get some more direct supervision on the train. And what impact would that have, uh, Mr. Bateman? I'm just curious. The uh, direct supervision. Well, it would it would it would have the crews uh, as far as um, it would free the crews up more to focus on customer service mm -hmm. as far as more than customer complaints. If you had a supervisor there, he could handle a lot of issues that take the crews away from doing their duty. Sometimes they could focus on providing a service as opposed to being distracted with uh, dealing with a lot of complaints and that sort of thing on the train. Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you all have any other suggestions? I think, uh, for one thing, uh, it's a small suggestion, but we need to be more paperless mm -hmm. on, on a lot of levels. Um, we waste a lot on papers, uh, on a, lot, a lot of different paper. You know, every, every day you come to work, you do all kinds of different sheets of paper as opposed to them verbally telling you things sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like, each employee every day he comes to work, he gets three sheets of paper. Uh, one for safety rule, one for FDA violation, one for customer service tips. As opposed to giving every employee every day that type of paper, they should just verbalize it to the employee and enforce it that way. Uh, also, I think we need to stop changing our schedules so much. We, we spend a lot of money every year on schedules. I don't know how many dollars they spend by, you know, by changing the schedules every six months. From my understanding, in Europe, they don't change the schedules quite so often. They have a basic schedule. It stays the same. But each time you change our schedule by two and three minutes here and there, it costs millions of dollars producing uh, uh, schedules throughout the whole system. You know, I think that would save a little bit. Well, did you, did you, were you listening, Mr. Hall? Yes, sir, I was. All right. I think, um, but I want to, again, I want to thank all of you for being here today. We've got, uh, we've got to, um, we still have work to do. And I, I'd be interested to see that timetable, Mr. Hall, uh, as soon as, uh, end of February. I think that's what we agreed on. Is that what you agreed on, Mr. Chairman, the end of February for that timetable? Uh, well, I'm hoping time table? they'll uh, uh, submit a plan that's acceptable and shows a path, to, mm -hmm. a path uh, forward. Uh, and um, if we have to do the hearing, we'll do the hearing. We'll look at it, whatever we might. I like to do round tables, sit down, see how we can work with them to get things done. But again, the only way you get things done around here is continue to hammer. Oh, I know. You know, I know. I know. <laughs> you got to tell me. <laughs> and I, of all the things. Because, you know, they wait. They, folks wait. I may not be the smartest. I may not be the best placed. I may not be the most powerful. But I yes, am, you are, Mr. I am a persistent <laughs> bastard. <laughs> hey, I yield back. Thank you. On, the, on that note. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, just in conclusion, I thank our witnesses. Um, we will come back. We will visit this if necessary. Uh, we do want to accomplish some positive steps. We do want to protect the uh, uh, welfare of the employees and the commitment we've made to them. There are many uh, thousands of people that work in Amtrak. I've often told Mr. Bateman this story, too. When I, uh, some years ago, it's what, 15, 10, 15 years ago, Amtrak had 29,000 employees. Now I think they have 19,000. To me, that's not a future. I think we can uh, dramatically increase the employment and people can earn good wages and good positions. But we have to be creative. We've got to look at, uh, again, how we expand the system, get support, bring America uh, into the 21st century of uh, transportation. There is no reason why we can't do that. So people working in the same direction and a positive direction. I didn't institute the Inspector General's uh, report, but I'm glad that we reviewed it. He has some recommendations, and I look forward to seeing a written uh, plan and action and steps taken uh, to deal with this uh, fairly and try to get the subsidy down as low as possible, as, as we've seen some examples or hear from. Um, we'll leave the record open for a period of 10 days. Uh, without objection, so ordered for additional statements. Mr. Chairman, um, uh, speaking of that, yeah. could I ask that Mr. Hall uh, and, and or the Inspector General get back to us for the record? Uh, I'd like to see, uh, in answer to my question, a schedule of the uh, federal subsidies or the federal 
underwriting of Amtrak over the last, say, five or six years, just to see the trend and the actual numbers? Well, I think you'll find it's about 1.5 down to about 1.3. But let me say this, uh, since you brought that up. The, how, wasn't the house mark uh, about cutting you in half? Wasn't it about seven hundred and yes. fifty million? Yeah. You think I'm I'm tough? If you have to institute uh, a fifty percent reduction, uh, it's going to make this food service uh, look like kitty play for you. But uh, uh, changes in, in in food service. But uh, again, uh, these are very difficult times and where we furloughed people, we've had uh, a horrible government shutdown, we've had all kinds of things to contend with and we're facing a serious financial crisis. So uh, we've got to deal with it, got to be prepared. We need to ex be expanding passenger rail in this country, not contracting uh, the service and doing a better job. At and that's all we're going to say today. I've already... I, I assume the chairman would agree to my request. Oh. Yes, yep. no problem. I'll Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Consider it done. Uh, if you get that and other questions. We will get that to you. And we, will ha we may have some additional questions we'd like the answer uh, to uh, from, uh, from you. I think some were mentioned in, during the hearing. The staff will get back in writing. Being no further business before the uh, House Government Oversight Reform Subcommittee on uh, Government Operations, this uh, hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you, John. Huh. Great job. Thank really. you very much. Although this cash